Okay. Okay, so uh, hi everyone, I'm T. I'm from Queen's University Belfast. I'm very glad to host this session for you. And I have a co-host in this session, Hassan is also here. And it's my great honor to welcome Professor David Birdsong from the University of Texas at Austin and Dr. Mark Emingle from the University of California, Santa Cruz, who will present open scholarship using the bilingual language profile. So now let's welcome them. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, on, on behalf of um, myself and Mark, as well as the choral team, uh, we're very grateful to be here. Uh, the Bilingual Language Profile, BLP, is an instrument to measure dominance. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll talk about what dominance is. It's asymmetries of skill in or use of one language over the other. And at the level of the individual bilingual, this asymmetry can play out in speaking or reading um, more words per minute than the other and more frequent everyday use of one language over the other ease of processing in one language vis-a-vis -vis the other. And these examples illustrate the relativistic nature of dominance within the individual bilingual. Relativity also applies across individuals. So for example, one Spanish-English bilingual can be more dominant in Spanish than another Spanish-English bilingual. And so these examples also suggest that dominance should be understood as a gradient continuous construct. So a bilingual is not simply dominant in one language or the other, they are dominant in that language to a certain measurable degree. Assessments of dominance, such as the BLP, bilingual language profile, assign numerical values or dominance indices to the degree of dominance at the level of the individual. Next slide. The BLP is an easy to use open source, no cost assessment instrument that yields global indices of dominance in one language over the other. And this is our 10th year anniversary. We developed the BLP back in 2012. And since then, it's been supported, hosted, and disseminated by CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning at UT Austin. And with this instrument, bilinguals self-assess for each of their languages on 19 questions covering four modules, language history, language use, language proficiency, and language attitudes. Next slide. The BLP is available in 20 different language versions, ranging from Arabic to Turkish. And we have taken those languages and paired them. We have 27 different language pairings, such as English, uh, Spanish, and Spanish, and English. And when responding, the respondents choose the language uh, of the questionnaire. Future users have been invited to translate and pair their BLP items. And they have done this a lot, as you'll see in the examples there that we have uh, uh, recognized and acknowledged the developers. On the next slide, we have a, a couple of just um, illustrations of what the instrument looks like. The starting page is bio information, next page. And the next page is language history. So we talk about what age you start learning, start feeling comfortable, how many classes you have had in the language, where you've lived, family, work environment, and so forth. Next slide. Um, language use. We ask people to talk about what they do in the average week with friends, with family, at school and work. How often do you talk to yourself? How many, often do you count in these languages? Next slide. Language professions say they self-rate on four skills. Language attitudes, this has turned out to be very important for us about how do you feel when you're using these languages? Do you feel like yourself? Do you identify with the culture? Is it important for you to behave or, or use a language like a native speaker? I want others to think that I am a native speaker of one of the other languages. Next slide. So to, to summarize, the BLP includes items that are based on skills. These are dimension-based items items that are domain-based relating to use and items that relate to attitude and identity. You can break out these dominance assessments by modules or use them globally as a composite index. And if you do, the scoring takes score for language A, subtracts language B for it, and you get the global index ranging from plus 218 to minus 218, where zero is perfect balance. BLP can be administered with pencil and paper, 
or with online Google and online Google will take your scores and calculate them automatically for you. And the BLB, BLP has been validated against other uh, uh, bilingual dominance instruments. Next one. Next slide, thanks. And just to uh, set us up for what we're talking about in terms of open scholarship, um, for example, the BLP has been used in participant screening and sorting in areas such as bilingual aphasia, in, in terms of cross-linguistic morphosyntactic priming, scores in BLP, and here's where we're talking about the BLP uh, in, in earnest today, uh, are found to be predictive of outcomes across a variety of fields and disciplines and domains of research and relating to diverse and compelling research questions. And here we have a start of a sample. Next slide. So um, I, what I've done here is taken the, um, the, uh, a screenshot of articles, which you'll see illustrate the diversity uh, of application of the BLP. We have, um, if you look closely, uh, titles of journals ranging from bilingualism to phonetics to brain sciences on this slide. Excellent, excellent. In this uh, slide, we see that uh, journals of neurolinguistics are, are coming into play. Um, let's see, the uh, International Journal of Bilingualism on the right, experimental brain research. Uh, here we're talking in fact about British Sign Language in a very recent uh, article. Next slide. Um, in another journal of cognitive, cultural cognitive science, we have uh, syntactic prediction in L1 processing. Frontiers in Psychology, Linguistic and Cognitive Effects of Bilingualism, another journal on Cognition and Motion, where semantic generalization of fear conditioning across languages in bilingualism. Next slide. Uh, one more illustration, code switching, um, stuttering, and then finally, racial ethnic identity modeling. And this is a, a fairly recent dissertation that has, has come up that has used the BLP. Next slide. So I'm going to give you three um, illustrations of specific articles. This one uh, relates to uh, statistical learning of an artificial language. And the arrow here says, Con crucially, a validated continuous measure, that's us, <laughs> of bilingual dominance predicted accuracy scores for both artificial languages in a generalized linear model. So if you go to the next slide, these are the two languages that the bilinguals were asked to, to learn. These were um, uh, residents of Singapore. They were English uh, Mandarin bilinguals and they had to learn these, these two languages. And if you've ever looked at artificial languages, this kind of thing looks pretty familiar. Next slide. And here, what we find is that BLP dominance indices for adults <laughs> predict statistical learning in an artificial language paradigm. And the, the image there shows that the closer you are to a balanced bilingual, that's to the left, the more accurate you are on both of, of these grammar learning tasks. And um, there's, a, there's a quote about the, um, the, the importance of this, this instrument and measuring dominance that appears in the article. And, and it, the article says this is the first time that this kind of thing has ever been used in statistical learning to, to predict who is successful and who's not. Next slide. Um, here we're talking about the uh, uh, production, the voice characteristics that are associated with the expression of uh, sincerity and sarcasm in, in heritage speakers. And you're, we're looking at uh, variations of, of, of pitch and so forth. And the arrow here, results indicate a two-way interactive effect of attitude and bilingual type and language and dominance on F0 mean and range, as well as a three-way interactive effect of attitude, language, and age with F0 mean. Um, let me show you how th this, this study was, was designed. Next slide. You'll see what they have done is they have broken out um, the participants by simultaneous and sequential, and then beneath that, broken out by low BOP scores, middle BOP scores, and high BOP scores in each of these two languages, English and Spanish. And then on the next slide, what you'll see is the findings where they find um, for speech rate, F0 mean, and F0 range, uh, interactions 
you know, each time involving dominance. And that's in the rightmost column there. And on the last uh, illustration, um, we see is, and I don't know this article very well, but it, apparently your, your, um, your responses to moral dilemmas depend on the language in which you actually respond to these test questions. And um, dominance, the dominant language is going to be predictive of uh, the response choice. Um, and before we uh, complete, um, to conclude this part, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our own research. Um, my work uh, is going to be followed by Mark's work um, that's uh, coming soon. And what I've done with dominance has started back in 2006, where uh, I made a case for looking at dominance in terms of theories of language learning, use, and loss. Um, I've worked in questions of age and dominance and bilingualism, dominance shifts and switches, and then uh, an article on measurement analysis and interpretation of dominance. And the last um, article that I cite down there, Birdsong and, and Amangual and Press, I'm going to put in a plug here. This is a chapter that's going to appear in a beautiful, extensive handbook of bilingual phonetics and phonology that Mark Amangual himself is, is editing. And I'm, I'm very excited about this volume and, and very grateful to have collaborated with Mark on, on a chapter in this particular volume. So Mark, your turn. Thank you very much, David. And um, I'm just gonna shift here to, to recent re research on bilingual phonetics and phonology and, and where the, the BLP has come in handy. So I'm going to be uh, showcasing um, some of the results of three studies. Um, one focusing on Spanish Catalan bilinguals, specifically the production of Catalan mid-vowels. Another one on the production and perception of Galician mid-vowels uh, by Spanish Galician bilinguals. And then finally, I'm going to go over some of the results of a project on Spanish English bilingual production of Spanish and English laterals. So to start off with, um, with Catalan, just to say that, that the Catalan vowel system provides a, a good opportunity to test the bilingual speech production and perception of, of early bilinguals. Because um, Spanish has a simple five vowel system, how it, but on the other hand, Catalan has a, has a seven vowel system with an additional contrast in height. So we can distinguish between uh, higher mid vowels, a and o, from the lower mid vowels, a and a in stress syllables, as you can see here on uh, the right side. And um, the BLP was used here uh, to categorize participants into two distinct groups. So after every single participant, um, I'm, I'm talking about 60 participants in this particular study, completed the bilingual language profile questionnaire, uh, we can see uh, this, this uh, distribution into two separate groups. Um, those on the right were the Catalan dominant group and uh, those that were uh, on the left side that had negative BLP scores were the Spanish dominant group. So the results I'm gonna show uh, relate to uh, speech production. So there, were, there was the, the study of the production of the target vowels E and E in Catalan and the O and O vowels in Catalan. And I'm going to be um, showing you in this graph, the results um, looking at individual scores per participant. So we have the 60 participants um, represented here. And on the y-axis, what you can see is the Euclidean distance. That is the acoustic distance between the both mid vowels in Catalan. So the higher the Euclidean distance, there's more uh, separation between those mid vowel categories. And the lower the Euclidean distance, there's more convergence or, or merger. So in that case, it would be a more, a more Spanish-like uh, vowel system. And uh, in the panel on the left, you have the Spanish dominance. In the panel on the right, you have the Catalan dominant bilinguals. And uh, on the x-axis, you have the BLP score. So as we turn more to the left, they're more extremely Spanish dominant. And as you move to the right, uh, they will shift to more Catalan dominant bilinguals. Right, so, so looking at the scores here, we can find a positive correlation, right? Uh, as you become 
Well, well, let's look at it this way. As you become more Spanish dominant, you actually have a smaller Euclidean distance between those mid-vowel targets. Um, we see that there's no significant, there's more or less stabilized when you're a Catalan dominant bilingual. So those individual BOP scores weren't as predictive, um, but there definitely were for the Spanish dominant bilinguals. And we see this for the E, E mid-vowel contrast, and we can also find the same pattern for the low, um, for the back mid-vowel contrast. Same pattern as well, okay? So I'm shifting here to a different population, but the same phonetic variable. So mid-vowel contrasts in Galician um, Spanish bilingual. So Galician also has the mid-vowel contrast that Spanish does not have. So a similar study here, I'm gonna show some results on perception and production. And the BLP was instrumental, again, in categorizing groups, uh, not just uh, keeping this, this, um, this categorical distinction between two groups, but also as a way to be able to um, look at the, at the degree of, of dominance in one language or another, and how we could get a, a more, bit more of a fine-grained analysis if we took individual uh, participant into, into account. So for the perception task, um, stimuli, seven steps were, were created synthetically between a prototypical E, in this case, we, the word P was used as the letter P, and P, which is foot. So we have a minimal pair there for the front mid vowels and another minimal pair for the back mid vowels, like also and also. And uh, seven steps were created uh, for those mid vowels were manipulated in a continuum from an E to an E and from an O to an A. So those uh, stimuli were, were, um, were, were randomly mixed into uh, an uh, identification task and participants had to press one button if they heard uh, either one of these P or they heard P or if they heard also or they heard also in two different sessions. And the results indicated uh, very clearly that there were different perceptual patterns in the phonetic behavior of these different groups. So we can see the Galician dominant group is on the, the blue lines and the Spanish dominant group uh, is what we have here indicated in the red lines. On the left side, you have the front mid vowels and on the right side, you have the back mid vowels. And again, X axis, we have the different stimuli and, and the percent of or percent of air responses on the y-axis. And what we can see here with the blue line is a, a textbook example of categorical perception, right? And, and, and we find the um, difficulties in perce perceiving these contrasts for the Spanish dominant group. Looking at the same population of their production, we can see the Spanish dominants are merging these categories uh, quite a lot more. And if we, look at the PLI measurement, which is the degree of, let's see, distribution of that vowel. Again, this is similar to the Euclidean distance and that we can individually quantify how much overlap there are between these two categories in their production. And we can see very strikingly that the Galician dominance here, can, we can predict how much um, overlap there are between these categories as you become more balanced bilingual or closer to the Spanish dominant bilingual group. And we see this for the front mid vowels, but also for the back mid vowels. And then the final study that I want to go over really quickly refers to the production of L's in Spanish and English. So just to go through this quickly, the English L's are more velarized. They are known as being dark L's. They're produced further back in the mouth. And the Spanish L's are alveolar. They're produced a lot more front. And here, the BLP was used to categorize the dominance of four different groups, four different uh, groups based on their sociolinguistic uh, generation of immigration. We have a generation 1.5, a generation 2, a generation 3, and then a second language learners of Spanish. Um, one of the variables looked at here are syllable position, because in English, we expect a darker L in post-vocalic position, while in Spanish, we expect, um, sorry, and while it's more lighter in pre-vocalic position, the syllable position isn't expected to affect the Spanish laterals. And then importantly here, language mode was one of the main um, variables under, under investigation. So just to wrap up with the results, we can see that 
all four groups maintain distinct L's in their production um, in Spanish and English. On the y-axis, you can see the F2 minus F1 measurements. Um, in terms of the differences based on um, syllable position, we can see that in word initial position, that's the light gray, they're typically produced uh, lighter. That's uh, more fronted in their, in, in their pronunciation in English, but not in Spanish. Uh, in comparison to word final position. So that's as expected. This um, allophonic distribution that exists in English is not transferred to Spanish. And then interestingly, if we take into account those four groups and looking at the, the effects of bilingual mode into their productions, what we can see here is that the productions in bilingual mode are affecting each of these groups but only in their least dominant language. So here, language dominance was an important predictor of cross-linguistic influence in the pronunciation of L's, but specifically for their non-dominant language. And I'll pass it back on to David. Okay, so I wanted to wrap up with this final slide here, um, where I want to make it clear how grateful we are Mark and I and Libby Gurk and, and the entire choral team um, for having had the opportunity to contribute to scholarship and research so often uh, and in so many very domains over the years. Uh, we illustrate um, our contribution here in this little slide with the latest screenshot of, um, of Google, um, Google Scholar. We've got 381 citations to date. In 2020, we had 86. We expect more to accumulate for 2021, probably getting over 90. And uh, I think that the momentum is there. Um, we, we feel as if that open scholarship has always been a, a, a marvelous research, a research tool and resource. So we're, um, again, very excited and grateful to have done our part uh, to help out other researchers. Thank you. Next slide, Mark.